Well, good morning again. I don't know if I mentioned it before, but my name is Brett. I'm the lead pastor here at New Life Church, and I am excited that you are here this morning. I love coming to church on Sunday, which is probably a good thing because I'm the pastor, right? Uh, which I hope that you get up every day too, excited to be a part of whatever's going on in life. And that Sunday potentially could be a special day as you get the opportunity to be here, as we get the opportunity to be here. And so as the snow comes in, especially when it's going to be overnight, that's my biggest fear. Because like, no, I have to be there on Sunday. I have to be there. I have to get all these thoughts inside my head out. And I want to come and I want to be with you guys and worship. I love my spot right in the front. In fact, I don't know why this row is empty most of the time. I don't quite fully understand it because it's one of the best seats in the house. And the reason is not because you're close to the stage, but you're in front of everybody out there who's singing. And that's what makes it so special for me is sitting in the front. Not only do I hear what's coming from the stage, but I hear what's coming from behind me. And it is very powerful. As we gather together, as we talk about verses where everybody, every race, age, everybody will be represented in some way, shape, or form before the throne, and there will be singing, it is powerful. And so the fact that we get to do that on Sunday is something that I get really excited about. And then we sing songs like the one we just did, Living Hope, which is an anthem for me because I don't know about you, but there are times where I feel hopeless as I start understanding who I am, as I grow older, I start realizing things about myself that I didn't know when I was in high school, that I didn't know as a little kid, that I didn't know in my mid-20s, and that I'm now in my late 30s going, oh, yeah, that's totally me. One of those things being that I have a little bit of a rebellious streak inside of me. Anybody relate to that? Like one of you? Seriously. Well, if that's the case, you're going to learn a lot today about yourself. I have a little bit of a rebellious streak. I have a tendency at times to do things just because somebody tells me I shouldn't. They're like, you know what? If you do this or do that, it's going to lead to, and I'm like, yeah, well, I just want to try it. See what happens. Why not? Don't tell me I can't because if you tell me I can't, I'm going to. And I've started to realize that as I get older, I become more crankier in that way. And it actually gives me like fuel to then go do it. Oh, you don't think that can happen? Ooh, here we go. But, you know, one of the times in my life where it was specifically evident was the summer after my senior year of high school. That stage where you're getting ready to go, you're getting ready to leave, and you're trying to figure out what freedom looks like. And now that I'm removed from that season of my life, I can tell you that I probably didn't handle it to the best of my abilities, that I didn't do it very well, that I was in a season where my parents, who were trying to help me figure out what independence looked like, still said, you're underneath the rule of our house, and while you're here, there's certain things that you have to do. And I went, why? I'm leaving anyways. What are you going to do? Kick me out? <laughs> that was the attitude. I know. Whew. And so there were things, like they still imposed a curfew on me the summer of my senior year. Like, how fair is that? Seriously, a curfew? Like, when you get to college, what's curfew? In fact, I remember a moment I played basketball in college and we were going to a 6 a.m. workout and we walked out the doors of our dorm room and there were two guys sitting on the steps and we were like late night or early morning and they're like late night <laughs> at 6 a.m. That's college. And that's what I was excited about going into that season of my life going, woo, I can do whatever I want. And so I'm going to start that now, mom and dad. What are you going to do about it? And so they imposed curfew. I broke it a couple of times and yet there was something inside of me that went, I really probably shouldn't do this. I should probably listen to mom and dad. I bet they know what they're talking about, and yet I still continue to push the limits. So after I broke curfew a couple times, I decided, you know what, I'll come home at curfew, but I'm not coming inside. And so I'd sit outside with my friends that didn't have curfew, and we'd be out there to the wee hours of the morning going, hey, at least I came home, right? At least I'm here, but I'm not going to walk in the door. And there were other things, hanging out with people that my parents didn't necessarily approve of and things that now I look back on it going, man, I was a complete tool. I really was. And yet, the side note on that is if you are a parent that has a child like that, there's hope. <laughs> maybe someday, maybe it might take to their late 30s, they'll realize that they too were a tool. And you can tell them right now, someday you're going to realize you're a tool. And then pray that someday they'll be used as a tool for Jesus, right? 
that God will transform their hearts. Or maybe you resonate with it because you were that person. That you hear my story and you're like, yep, lived it, done it, been there. Why? Because every single one of us in some way, shape, or form has a rebelliousness within us. In fact, as human beings, it's a part of our nature. We are a rebellious people. It's part of our human nature. It's a part of how we are wired. It's within us. And today, we're going to look at that. We're going to look at this idea of rebelliousness. We're going to look at where does it come from. And then we're going to look at, is there hope? Is there a way out? Is there an answer to this problem that I don't know about you, but in my life, I'm identifying more and more. So I want you to open with me this morning to Joshua chapter 10. Excuse me, chapter 10. We're continuing our series in Joshua. We're going to be in Joshua chapter 10, starting in verse 28. We're going to go all the way through chapter 12. We're not going to read all of it this morning. In fact, it's such a large passage. We're going to do it in two parts. So we're going to do part one today and part two next week. But we're going to focus on those verses and really looking at this idea of rebelliousness as we continue to follow Joshua in his campaign. And so as we get to this part in Joshua chapter 10, verse 28, the military campaign against the Canaanites, against those that are in the promised land, is in full swing. We've gotten to this place where the Israelites crossed the Jordan. They moved into the promised land. They went into Jericho. They went into Ai. There was a, a period where they made a treaty, a peace treaty with Gibeon. Because of that peace treaty, it shoved them into this battle with these kings that came to fight Gibeon because they had become allies of Israel. Gibeon's former allies were now their enemies because they had allied themselves with Israel. And in all of that, this battle erupts with these southern kings. And so I want to take a look at a, a map just to kind of give you a picture of what that looks like. Just to give you an idea of who these southern kings were, here's this picture again of the campaign that Joshua has been on. Gilgal has been their home base. They went into Gibeon. They fought in Gibeon. God fought on their behalf. They captured five kings. They put them in a cave. Then they went after the other individuals that were there, and they were able to capture everybody in that one, that one battle. But then that battle spawned into another battle that led them down now into the southern part of Israel. And for the sake of today, there's two parts we talk about, the southern part and the northern part. This battle in the end of chapter 10 is the southern part. And as they go into this battle, God continues to be with them. And it's a pretty quick fight. In fact, it tells us in Joshua 10.40 that Joshua subdued the whole region, including the hill country, the Negev, the western foothills, and the mountain slopes, together with all their kings. And in verse 42, all these kings and their lands Joshua conquered in one campaign because the Lord, the God of Israel, fought for Israel. It was fast. We don't know how fast, but the passage there is translated that all happened at once. And so they conquered it in one campaign. It all happened in this one moment. And so it was probably a couple of months. It didn't take long. They went into the southern kingdoms. They had captured the kings already, these five kings that had kind of been the head of the dragon that had come after Gibeon. And now they're in the southern land and God gives them the land because they were, or God was fighting with Israel. And so as this battle's taking place, there's another group of individuals that hears about what's going on. And so there's a pattern in Joshua that we see over and over and over again. As they come into the promised land, you see in chapter two, Rahab heard what had happened to the kings on the other side of the Jordan. And so because of that, she says, we understand that your God is a big God and he fights on your behalf. And she said, I want to be a part of that. And so as she then steps in line with Israel, Israel then goes into Jericho where she was living at the time and takes Jericho. But Jericho had heard about what they had done to the other kings. And this pattern continues. They go into Ai. Gibeon heard what they had done in Jericho and Ai. As they get into Gibeon, the southern kings had heard what had happened to those that were, or to the Gibeonites and to what happened in Jericho and Ai. And now the northern kings hear about what's happening to the southern kings. And so this pattern's there because the author is telling us God is being known. What he's doing, people are hearing about and they understand what's taking place. And he's then sharing with us what their reaction is to this movement through the promised land. And so the southern kings are taken over by Joshua. And the northern kings, instead of sitting there going, hey, maybe we'll be like Gibeon. 
and we'll start a peace treaty. Instead, you know what? The issue with the southern kings is they weren't large enough. They didn't have enough people. They couldn't fight because they needed more individuals. And so an individual in the northern part, King Jabin, decides to put together a much larger contingent of individuals to come after the Israelites. And so in chapter 11, verse 1, it says this. So when Jabin, king of Hazar, heard this, he sent word to Jobab, king of Madon, to the kings of Shimron and Akshaph, and to the northern kings who were in the mountains, in the Arabah, south of Kinnereth in the western foothills, in the Naphath door on the west, to the Canaanites in the east and to the west, to the Amorites, Hittites, Perizzites, Jebusites in the hill country, and to the Hivites below Hermon in the region of Mizpah. So what are all those names for? Well, the author is trying to give us an idea that he reached out to a lot of people. That they had heard what had happened in the southern region and the northern kings now are sitting there going, all right, so we need to do something about this. And we're going to do what they weren't able to do, even though they've heard that God is on the move. They're making this intentional decision to do something about it. And so they call all of these people together. Well, how many people ended up showing up? Verse 4, 11, 4. They came out with all of their troops and a large number of horses and chariots, a huge army, as numerous as the sand on the seashore. There were a lot of people. Joshua's in some serious trouble. Take a look at the northern kingdoms. Here's all the cities that were involved in that. You can see the names, Akshaph, Dor, Shimron, Sidon, all of the cities that are mentioned here, these are the kings that Jabin goes after and says, all right, we need to do something about this. So the previous map I, sh map I showed you, that was the southern part. This is now the northern part. Gilgal now is down on the right-hand side. And all these kings gather together with all of their people in this army that was numerous as the sand on the seashore. Enough to make you kind of quake in your boots a little bit. And yet God wasn't surprised. He says this to Joshua in verse 6. The Lord said to Joshua, Do not be afraid of them, because by this time tomorrow I will hand all of them slain over to Israel. You are to hamstring their horses and burn their chariots. So Joshua and his whole army came against them suddenly at the waters of Miram and attacked them. And the Lord gave them into the hand of Israel. Part two, just as happened to the southern kings, now the northern kings, even with this huge army, come against the Israelites. And the same thing happens as they did to the southern kings. That God was fighting with Israel and so gives them all into the hands of the Israelites. Verse 16, so Joshua took this entire land, the hill country, all the Negev, the whole region of Goshen, the western foothills, the Arabah and the mountains of Israel with their foothills, from Mount Halak, which rises towards Seir, to Baal Gad in the Valley of Lebanon below Mount Hermon. It was an epic battle. Army as large as the sand on the seashore comes against the Almighty God and the nation of Israel. And it was a war to end all wars. How long did this war last? This one took a lot longer. What's interesting is it's actually given in a much shorter period of time. So if you read what happens to the southern kings versus what happens to the northern kings, the story of the northern kings takes less time to be told by the author. Why? Because the victory was more powerful by God. And he's giving this, this understanding that there's all these people, and yet he only gives you this small glimpse into what the war happened or what happened in that battle, what happened to that war, because God was fighting for Israel, and it was something that, boom, happened. And yet we need to understand how long it took because as we read through it, it's really easy to go into these 16 verses and go, wow, man, that was quick. That was really fast. Because the one in the south was quick. It was only a couple months. The one in the north was not. In fact, that's exactly what it tells us in verse 18, that Joshua waged war against all these kings for a long time. But even though it only tells us in 18 verses what took place, it waged for a long time. Well, how long is a long time? Well, they tried to map it out. What was the timeline of this battle? Well, in comparison to the couple months it took with the southern kings, there's a good chance that this battle took about seven years. Somewhere between five and seven years was the battle with the northern kings, where God's fighting with Israel in this specific situation. And if you turn to the next chapter, in chapter 12, 
If we look at all of the kings that Israel fought with, there's a total of 31 kings. So the battle as a whole between the southern kings, the northern kings, Jericho, all of it, probably took somewhere in the ballpark of 8 to 10 years for Israel to fight this battle. In fact, it took so long that Joshua went from being this spry young leader, this warrior who's got this sword and this armor and this exciting guy. If you go into chapter 13, he's now an old guy. In fact, we'll see in a couple of weeks that verse or chapter 13 starts with the verse where God says, and now Joshua, as he was an old man, had gotten to this point. And so this war waged for a while. And why is it important that this war waged for a long time? Why are we focusing on the time of this war? Because it takes us back to this idea that we are rebellious people. You see, this war could have ended a lot sooner. In fact, it could have been over. It could have been done because the northern kings could have looked at the southern kings, could have seen what happened in Jericho, could have heard what had taken place across the Jordan, which Gibeon had. And they could have made a decision to say, you know what, instead of fighting, we're going to do something a little bit different. We're actually going to maybe ask some questions and say, why is this taking place? Or we're going to look at what God is doing and go, well, maybe we're on the wrong side of the battle. And instead of fighting on this side, we should be fighting on the other side. And maybe we should be on God's side rather than our own side. And the battle could have ended. It could have been finished. It could have been done except for one simple, small, little thing. And that's this idea of rebellion. The thing that's inside of every single one of us was also inside the army of the Canaanites. They did not want to stop fighting. They did not want to give in. They did not want to lose. And so they continue on. And as they continue on, they continue to emphasize the fact that they were enemies of God. And this battle, as much as it was physical on those plains with numerous individuals, as many as sand on the seashore, wasn't just a physical battle, it was a spiritual battle. It was a spiritual battle that was waging right there in the middle of the promised land as this rebellious creature, human being, said, God, we will not give in. We will fight to the very end because they declared, God, we are your enemies. Which poses the question then, does God have enemies? Are there enemies of God? Which I think for us is hard at times to think through. In fact, modern theology would argue that the answer to that question is no. God is love. God is fluffy. God is some giant sitting on a cloud with a really cool beard covered in white kitty cats. Right? Have you ever seen that Hanes commercial where like Michael Jordan's in it and the guy's sitting there trying to, yeah, never mind, white cats are crawling all over him. It looks really cool. Like think about white cats, just like soft and fluffy and you could hug God covered in white cats. That'd be cool. And then he's just okay with everything. It just sits there allowing things to take place because we've elevated this idea of love so far above other things that we've forgotten what actually is love. And so when we talk about the idea that God had enemies, is that loving? I don't know. Let's take a look. To answer the question, we have to ask, does God have enemies? And then look at what we've been talking about in this series. God issues a question to every single one of us. An invitation, a statement, an ultimatum, a challenge that we've seen from the very beginning of this, that God asks each and every one of us this very simple question. Are you for me or against me? Are you for me or against me? He'd ask the Israelites this. Are you for me or against me? He asked the nation of Israel, Joshua specifically as the leader. He asked the Canaanites and he asked you and me the question, are you for me or against me? And every single one of us, I truly believe at some point in life has to answer the question, are we for God or against God? And that we have the ability to say yes or no. One of the things that we have to understand is if we answer the question no, then scripture tells us that we then are enemies of God. That if we are not for God, we are against God. That we are not with him, we are against him. And this is exactly what the Canaanites were doing. They had answered the question. God had said, are you for me or against me? And they had said, we are against you. 
And out of that, they continued to fight. They rebelled. They said, we will not give in, God. We will not go the way you want us to. And so we will battle. So where does that come from? Why does that happen? In every single one of us, there is this tension. There's this desire to be with God and desire to run from God. Where do we get all of this? Well, we need to go back to the very beginning of time. We were created in the image of God. God issues this invitation because there's a separation between him and us where he comes now and says, will you come back in relationship with me? Because there was this thing called rebellion. Rebellion started this distance between us and God. And so in us, there's this good versus evil desire. There's a sense of, God, I want to do what you want me to say. I believe there is a God. I wrestle with this internally. And yet I also sit here going, I don't think I believe in God. I'm not sure there is a God because I also wrestle with this idea of rebellion. Because if you give me rules and you tell me things there are, that, tell me there are things that I cannot do, what do I naturally want to do? I want to do them. Why do I fight with reading the Bible? Why do I fight with this idea that there's a holy God that has expectations for me because inside I just don't want to do it? Ah! Why? I don't know. I don't know. As I understand the rebelliousness inside of me, as I stand here, as I read passages like this, I want to stomp my feet and say, God, that's not fair. I don't like you. Why? Because it's a part of who we are. How did it become a part of who we are? Well, from the very beginning, there's been this idea of rebellion. It started in a very specific moment that the Bible only gives us glimpses into, but those glimpses are fascinating. See, God created this being, this creature, the most beautiful creature ever created. Nothing was more beautiful before, and nothing has been created more beautiful since. In fact, in Ezekiel chapter 28, it gives us a glimpse into the beauty of this being. Ezekiel 28, 12, and 13. You are the seal of perfection, full of wisdom and perfect in beauty. You were in Eden, the garden of God. Every precious stone adorned you, carnelian, chrysolite, emerald, topaz, onyx, and jasper, lapis lazuli, turquoise, and beryl. Your settings and mountings were made of gold. On the day, they were, the day you were created, they were prepared. There was a being more beautiful than anything that had ever been created. In fact, this individual walked with God. They were with God. They were in the garden with God. They were in the presence of God regularly. And yet what this glimpse shows us is that just being with God wasn't good enough because in the beauty of this being, arrogance started growing. Instead of wanting to be with God, there was a desire to be God instead. And so he tried to become God. And he tried to raise his throne above God's throne. And that plan didn't work out. And so he was cast out and he was taken, everything was taken away from him. And so instead of gaining everything, he lost it all in his desire to be God and not just be content with being with God. And so in Revelation chapter 12, it tells us of what it looked like when he was cast out. He took one third of all angels with him in his rebellion, and each one of them was cast out of heaven. Utterly disgraced. Sent out of the presence of God. And yet that wasn't good enough. He wasn't just going to give up. He wasn't going to keep fighting. And so this individual with his now one-third army, turned his attention to the creation. Created as the most beautiful being that God had ever created, still wanting to be God, now disgraced with this army of individuals, he said, the way to become God is I will now take the greatest thing that God has ever created, and I will taint that. I will go after them, because if they stop following him and start following me, then I will be able to become God. That I will supplant God from his throne. That I will become God once and for all. This plan didn't work. Now I'm on to plan B. So what was plan B? Well, somehow he still had access to the garden. We see it in Genesis chapter 3. The serpent comes into the garden. And the humans that God had created, the greatest creation of all, this individual took the same lie that he believed to them and said, guess what? Being with God isn't good enough. You can be God. That if you eat of this fruit, 
you will be just like God. And so the same lie that he believed, he convinced Adam and Eve to believe. And because of their belief and their sin, there's this thing called imputed sin, that on behalf of all humanity, what they did, you and I now deal with. And one of the key issues of that first sin was this idea of rebellion. The idea of rebellion stems from the fact that I'm not just good enough being with God. I want to be God. And that's the fight that we all have inside of us. That's the fight that I had with my parents. I'm not good enough just being with you. I'm not good enough just living this amazing life. And thank you, mom and dad. And I know my mom's watching and she's probably sitting there going, praise the Lord, he realized it, woo. <laughs> but thank you for the life that you gave me, but I wasn't content with it because I wanted to be the one that was in control. I wanted to be the one that said, I will do this and I will do that. I wanted to be the one that was in charge. I did not want to submit and humble myself to the authority that I knew I should because there's something inside of me that continues to do that even now at my age going, oh, because there's this war that's waging. And that's what happened in that moment. A battle started. The battle of good versus evil, the most epic battle the world has ever seen. And I'm right in the middle of this battle. And my nature's right in this middle of this battle. Because if I was made in the image of God, there's part of me that, God, yes, I want to do everything you want me to do. I want to be with you. I want to be someone that shines so bright that when the world sees me, they see you. And that the other side, I'm sitting there going, no, I don't want to do that. I want to do this instead because this is more exciting and there's a battle that's waging, a war that is raging right now for your very soul. Right in the middle of what you're doing this moment. Everything in our culture attests to it. Everything speaks to it. You can't look at the headlines in our world today. You can't look at the movies that are coming out with seeing there is a battle going on. In fact, the greatest movies of all time have been made because we understand this battle of good versus evil. Star Wars, Lord of the Rings, Frozen. Good versus evil. This battle that I'm fighting every day. And that's what was going on here in Joshua. This wasn't just a physical battle. This was a spiritual battle. This was a rebellion. This was an all out affront on a holy God. Why? Because the enemy, Satan himself, the first one to ever rebel, who took us with him, wants it no other way. See, it's not okay if we just go down slowly. It's not okay if we just forget about God. It's not okay if we just kind of limp into oblivion. The enemy is about this all-out frontal attack to show God that he is not who he says he is, that he is not powerful, and he will do, Satan will do, everything he possibly can to bring us along in that battle. Because he knows that he's lost, and so he wants to take as many people with him as he possibly can, in any way he possibly can. And what would be best for him is if we stood here and shook our fist at God and said, I will not follow you. And that's what the Canaanites were doing. See, the pattern had been, they knew what was going on. They knew that God was moving. They had an option. They could have made a peace treaty. They could have said, no, we're in, but they didn't because they didn't want to. They had declared themselves enemies of God. Maybe you're sitting here going, well, come on, Brett, that's the Old Testament. That's not relevant anymore. That doesn't happen in our day to day. You're talking about some concept that's thousands of years old. That happened way far away with these terms, enemies of God and all that stuff. Well, the New Testament era is here. We're no longer enemies of God. Or are we? Because if God had enemies then... Does God still have enemies today? James chapter 4. You adulterous people, 
do you not know that friendship with the world is hostility toward God? Therefore, whoever wishes to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. Friendship with the world is hostility toward God. Therefore, whoever wishes to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. Is that just an Old Testament concept? See, what the Canaanites had done, what they had said is, we love this life more than this life. We love the world, God, more than we love you. We love our stuff. We love our cities. We love our lifestyle more than we love you. They become friends of the world. I think we have to be very careful where we lay our judgment in this because it's very easy at times to read passages like this and go, God is so unfair. He's so harsh. This is a tough Tough passage. And yet, where does human responsibility fall in that? Because God had waited 400 years. I want to put that in perspective. How old is the nation that we currently stand in? 243 years old. Which means that we have 157 more years before we get to the place that Canaan was to see the time frame that God had allowed them to understand who he was so they could make a different decision than they did. I don't know about you, but if I look at our world today and I project out another 157 years with no awakening, no revival, no Jesus, come to Jesus moment, what's our world going to look like? What's our nation going to look like? Where are we going to be at that time? And then we have to ask the question, who's going to be God? Who's going to be making the rules? Who's going to be telling everybody what to do? Who's going to be the power and authority that's in charge? And I don't know, but if I project out 157 years, where my mind goes is not super positive. You might think differently than me, and I'd love to have that conversation with you. I want to know, what's the thing that's going to bring us up here? Is it a generation needs to die? Well, there's many generations between now and 157 years. So which one is it that needs to go away for things to become good? What's going to take for us to go this direction? Because now even people that don't see eye to eye, they're not the only ones fighting. It's those that are supposed to be on the same side that are fighting with each other. And they're arguing about things. You're sitting there going, ah, why are we arguing about this? What's the issue again? I'm really kind of lost. Like, I just don't get it at times. And so I'm praying right now, only 243 years into this, God, do something, please. And God was so patient with the Canaanites that he gave them 400 years. And wherever your mind goes for the next 157 years, that was the land of Canaan. Take your mind there. Allow yourself to think about what it could look like in 157 years. And that's the situation Joshua steps into. As God is fighting for the Israelites as they come into this nation. But here's the deal. Every single one of us was at one time in the category of enemy. Every one of us. Romans 5.10 says this, for if while we were enemies, there's no if we were enemies, maybe we're enemies. No, if while we were enemies, because we each are born with this desire to follow the world, which at times is stronger than desire to follow God. And every single one of us at some point in our lives has extended the invitation that God has made, will you follow me? Are you for me or against me? And until we answer yes to that question, until we say that we are for God, guess what? We are against God. That we are an enemy of God. And there is nothing we can do about it. It's who we are. It's the nature of the world that we live in. And so when God extends that invitation, we then have to answer that question and say, what am I going to do with this? 
Well, there's a simple solution to it. You know what it is? Make a treaty with God. Make a treaty with God. In fact, there's a passage that shows God's heart in the middle of this. 11.19 says this, Except for the Hivites living in Gibeon, not one city made a treaty of peace with the Israelites. Even though they had heard, even though they knew, even though they had seen all of it, not a single city except for Gideon steps forward and says that we will make a treaty with you. Only one city. Why? Because we are a rebellious people. We don't want to. So when I say we must make a treaty with God, it's an impossible proposition. Nearly impossible. See, the beauty of where we stand today is that when we talk about a peace treaty, we talk about the fact that we need to make a treaty with God. God already made that treaty with us. Because Romans 5.10 goes on. For all, if while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of his son, much more having been reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. For if while we were enemies, when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of his son, much more, having been reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. See, God already made the treaty with us. Jesus is the treaty that God made with us. See, God looked at our situation. He looked at our rebellion. He understood because there had been this time frame of individuals as he had expressed this intent and desire for individuals to be a part of what he was doing repeatedly over and over and over and over and over and over and over again. Guess what we did not do? We did not make that treaty. We did not step into that. And at one point, at the perfect time, Scripture tells us Jesus came to do what? To be the one to make that treaty. To be the one to step into history and say there is a way out. For those that believed before, for those like Gibeon, for those like Rahab, for those individuals that looked at God and said we are in. And now those all the way past, 2,000 years removed from that situation when Jesus died on the cross, the peace treaty was made. And we can sign it and say I'm all in. I'm all in because of what it was that you did. I'm all in this rebelliousness within me. I want to get rid of it. Jesus, you are that peace treaty. And I'm signing my name to it. Because as the sin in the garden was imputed to us, as Adam and Eve did what they did, as we think about the unfairness of that, the counteraction to that, the fairness in this world is that Christ came and imputed his righteousness back to us. And said that understanding rebellion, you can now be free of it. You can now come out from underneath it. But guess what? We don't want to. The world does not want to accept that peace tree. And it is becoming more and more and more obvious. As we look at our world today, rebelliousness abounds. But again, Brett, the story you're reading is Joshua passage. That was for a past time. That will never happen again. In fact, your perspective is so far off. We're actually evolving in a positive direction. We're getting better. As I had conversations with individuals, they're like, your lens is the one that's wrong. We would never go back to that. We would never experience that again. We're not fighting against God. We're not enemies of God. We are God. Ooh. Well, guess what? As much as that passage in Joshua was historical, it's also somewhat prophetic. Why? Because as human beings, we don't change very much. Regardless of the thousands of years that have passed, there will be a time where we will experience rebellion once again. And so I want to show you the picture of the northern map. Right down in the very bottom almost, there's a little dot called Megiddo. Megiddo sits almost right smack center between the southern kings and the northern kings. And Megiddo is extremely important because it's believed that right there is where this thing called the Battle of Armageddon will take place. 
that what happened with Joshua between the southern kings and the northern kings with an army the size of the sand on the seashore will be replicated once more in almost the exact same spot. In fact, bringing all of the armies together right there. In fact, this next picture shows you the valley of Megiddo. It's huge. Revelation tells us that on that plain right there, it's estimated where the battle of Armageddon will take place, that once again, an army will amass itself the size of the sand of the seashore. Why? Because we want to be God. Because one more time, we will rebel. Revelation 9, 20 through 21 the rest of mankind who were not killed by these plagues still did not repent of the work of their hands. They did not stop worshiping demons and idols of God, silver, bronze, stone, and wood, idols that cannot see or hear or walk. Nor did they repent of their murders, their magic arts, their sexual immorality, or their thefts. There will be rebellion which will result in a battle. Revelation 16, 10 through 21. The fifth angel poured out his bowl on the throne of the beast and his kingdom was plunged into darkness. People gnawed their tongues in agony and cursed the God of heaven because of their pains and their sores, but they refused to repent of what they had done. Refused to repent. The sixth angel poured out his bowl on the great river Euphrates and its water was dried up to prepare the way for the kings from the east. Where are the kings of the east going? To Megiddo. I saw three impure spirits that looked like frogs. They came out of the mouth of the dragon, out of the mouth of the beast, and out of the mouth of the false prophet. They are demonic spirits that perform signs, and they go out to the kings of the whole world to gather them for the battle on the great day of God Almighty. Look, I come like a thief. Blessed is the one who stays awake and remains clothed so as to not go naked and be shamefully exposed. Then they gathered the kings, these demonic spirits, demonic spirits, gathered the kings together to the place that in Hebrew is called Armageddon, Megiddo. See, it's hard at times to read this passage in Joshua because we've so evolved in our modern society to go, this will never happen again. And I can't really believe that it ever happened at one time. Well, the reality is, it did happen, and it will happen again. But in the middle of this, we have to be very careful. We cannot act as the victim. We are not the victim. The Canaanites were not the victim. Because our rebelliousness leads us to stand in the face of God and shake our fist. And that's exactly how the enemy wants it. That we are individuals that stand here going, no, I will not follow you and willingly step into these issues and into these situations and into these battles. And that the rebelliousness inside of us wants to go, God, you are awful and you are horrible and you are wrong. Why? Because I want to be God. Because here's a simple solution. Here's a really easy answer right now. What if all of us just took a step over here and followed exactly what God wanted us to do. Think about it. Let's just take the Bible and actually live it out. Let's just all do it right now. Okay, ready, go. And let's just easily convince the rest of the world to do the exact same thing. Because I can promise you that if we all did that, our problems would go away. Would go away. Everything would be solved. All the issues would be solved. But guess what? Oh, and this is where it gets tough. I might have to give up some of my lifestyle that I really like. I might have to give up parts of me that I want to hold on to that I'm rebelling against God with because guess what, God? I like that more than I like this. And so this easy solution, this simple thing, the problem can go away tomorrow, will never happen. Why? Because we are rebellious people. Which then makes me think the Bible is even so much more true because it's telling us this is exactly what's going to happen. This is what's going to take place. And yet God says, I have the answer for you. I can tell you where it is. It's right here. Just do it. Whoop, just do it. It's like my kids. I say that all the time. Just do it. You know how easy your life will be if you just listen to me? Just do it. 
not because I hate you, not because I'm evil, not because I want to like bring down the hammer. No, I love you. That's exactly what God is trying to say to us. I love you. Just do it. It's so simple. And yet we won't. And so what's our role in this world right now as we understand this? We must tell people about it. We must warn people about it. I hope this passage makes you cringe. I hope as you read this more thoroughly, as you go away from here, that you read through this and it makes you go, Ooh. because I hope it fires you up to tell people that this is real. And this is something that we have to deal with. This message is going to be online. People can freely watch it. They're going to hear this. And yet we live in a world where most won't do anything about it. And so we have to do everything we possibly can to tell people that this is real. And then fifth, we have to understand that in the middle of all of it, God still wins. There will be people that listen to that message. There will be many that don't. There will be trials and tribulations, and we know how the end of the book is written. And for the sake of individuals that are here today in this room and those we love outside of it, we have to share this with the world. Because no matter how hard we fight, no matter how hard we rebel, no matter how hard we push against God, guess what? God still wins. And it would be a disservice on our part to not share that with the whole world. God still wins. And as believers, as individuals that know who God is, that should give you strength, that should give you courage, that should challenge you to be everything you possibly can be in this world today. Because someday, when God comes back, when the battle of Armageddon happens, when it's all said and done, he will be victorious. And those who know, those who've accepted the invitation, those who say, God, I am for you, will stand in victory with him. I can't wait. Whoo! Until that day comes, we have to wait. What does God's victory look like? What does it mean that he wins? You have to come back next week and find out. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you. We thank you so much for who you are. We thank you that you are a God that loves each and every one of us. That there is no mistake that we are here, Lord. That you have put us right where you want us to be in this moment, in this place. Whether we're watching online or we're in this room in this moment, God. That you have given us this message and that we have to do something with it. That your word is not something that's outdated, that it's old. That it speaks to each one of us that we are the rebellious people, that we are the ones that at one time were enemies of God, that we needed to sign that peace treaty and yet we could not do it on our own and so you did it for us. Jesus, you came, you died. You paved the way and rose again so that through your death, we have been justified. And through your life, we have been saved. So I pray, Lord, that we don't allow this message to stay here, that we take it with us because the world, as it has before, is heading back in the same direction. And Lord, I pray you break our hearts for those who need to know. And that new life will be a place where your message will be proclaimed, where revival will happen, Lord, as we want to be with you. So Lord, break us shape us, mold us, make us, and the individuals that are with you, that love you, that know you, and share you with the whole world. We thank you. We praise you. We give it all to you. In Jesus' name, amen.